remain standing for the reading of God's word. We're going to be reading this morning from Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. Hmm. (laughs) Sorry. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for rising from the dead and changing everything for us. As Cody comes and preaches on this passage today, I pray that you will help us all to see how glorious that fact is. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You can have a seat. Hey, good morning, guys. My name is Cody. I get to be one of the pastors here at the table, and um, I know that there may be some people still coming in. Um, like most churches, there's always room down front, so um, go ahead, come on in. Our kids are going to be coming in and joining us a little bit later, but um, but that it, that's no excuse to... Re- to not come in and get a seat. They can come in and sit on the floor and stand and, and sing with us. But uh, we're super glad that you're here with us today. Um, this is a big Sunday for Christians. Um, I'm so glad that we got to read prayers from Christians down throughout the ages and stuff like that. Um, it's just a good, good uh, day. But it also hinges on, did it really happen? I mean, the resurrection of Christ, this is a hinge point for Christianity. Did it really happen? Now, I, I have not met everybody that's here yet today. My guess is there may be some of you here today. Most of us believe that the resurrection happened, but there may be some of you that you came with a friend or you came because you're seeing Matt baptized today here at the end of the service or, or whatever it is. Somebody's been nagging you about coming to church. You're like, all right, I'll go ahead and go on Easter and get it out of the way. But, I, I don't, but I'm, I'm just guessing that there may be some here today that you're, you're not sure if Jesus resurrected. Um, but it's why Christians gather every week. It's why we serve one another. It's why we forgive one another. It's why we sing together. Um, and it's why we invite our friends to come back to this every, every week. So we believe that Jesus is alive and that this changes everything. And that he continuously changes our lives. But if you question that, what I want to do today is just kind of open it up and say and answer three questions. Is it possible that the resurrection happened? Number two, is it reasonable? And then number three, what difference does it make? So that's what I want to do. Some of you may question if the resurrection of Christ happened. Maybe even some that definitely don't believe that it happened. Regardless, we are really, really glad that you're here today. And I hope to give you some things to think about and possibly even talk about with me or with your friends afterwards. And if you are a Christian that you have friends that don't believe in the resurrection, I hope to give you some things to talk about with your friends that aren't here yet. So. Let's go ahead and dive into this. Is it possible that the resurrection happened? This is going to be kind of a little bit more philosophical, technical, theological um, part, or, well, not really theological. Um, the Bible says that it did. The Bible says that it happened. We just read one of the passages, it, and, and all of the passages, or all of the gospel accounts, say that Jesus resurrected. The book of Acts purports that Jesus did resurrect from the dead. 
Corinthians, Paul talks about how Jesus appeared to over 500 people at once. The Bible unequivocally states that Jesus did resurrect from the dead. The question, though, is do we believe the Bible? There's this popular belief that the Bible was written hundreds of years after these events and that the authors just made this up to start a world religion. And there, you may have some friends that have a hard time believing the Bible. Maybe you're here today and you have a hard time believing the Bible. But I want to tell you that it's just simply not true that the Bible was written hundreds of years after these events took place. That's just simply not true. I want you to look at this chart here. This is, takes documents from antiquity. It doesn't list all of them, but it lists some of them that maybe you're familiar with. You've probably heard of a guy named Plato. He was a pretty big deal in philosophy. He wrote between the years of 427 and 347 B.C. And the earliest copy, not original manuscript, the earliest copy of any of his writings that we have came from A.D. 900. That's 1,200 years after he wrote it. And we only have seven copies of what he said. And yet, if you go to any university, if you go to any high school, they will, tell, they will teach you Plato. Similar to Julius Caesar, who wrote 100 to 44 B.C. Earliest copy we have is from 900 A.D. That's 1,000 years. So we're getting closer. We've moved up 200 years. We only have 10 copies of what he said. What about Aristotle? We've heard of Aristotle, right? Aristotle wrote 384 to 322. Earliest copy is 1100, 1400 years after he wrote. And we only have 49 copies. We're getting better. We have 49 copies. But because of all of those things, because we have so few copies of what they actually wrote, we have no original manuscripts. We can't really determine with any degree of confidence how accurate these manuscripts and these copies were. What about Homer? Surely we remember junior high English, and reading the Odyssey and the Iliad, right? Homer wrote in 900 B.C. The earliest copy was 400 B.C. Well, this is big. Now we're out of the four digits. This is written within 500 years. We have evidence Manuscript evidence of 500 years close to when he originally wrote it. And we have 643 copies of this. And we believe it to be 95% accurate, even though it's separated by 500 years. And we have no original manuscripts. How does that stack up to the Bible? The Bible, the New Testament, was written between 45 A.D. and 100, which is merely 12 years started after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The earliest copy we have of manuscripts is A.D. 130. That is less than 100 years from the original writing. Now, my question is, how does that stack up to Plato, Aristotle, Homer, and Caesar? Less than 100 years compared to 500, 1,100, 1,000, 1,400 years? What about the manuscripts? How many, how many copies of this do we have? 5,600. 5,600 and some change of, a, of Greek manuscripts that were copies of the original that are within... Less than a hundred years of the original writing. To a degree of accuracy of 99.5%. If you claim that the Bible was written hundreds of years afterwards, and we can't take what the Bible says as true, I'm sorry, but you just don't know your history. You're just not that familiar with ancient manuscripts from antiquity. The Bible... The New Testament specifically is one of the most historically reliable, accurate documents from antiquity. There's a comedian by the name of Jeff Allen. 
And his testimony is that he was an atheist turned Christian. And he describes being confronted by a Christian who was, wanted to be a comedian and had lots of money and took him to the golf course. And he really didn't like the fact that he was a Christian, but he really liked to play golf. So he went to the golf course and they were out there talking one day and the Christian who is rich and wealthy and aspires to be a comedian says, well, you know what the Bible says? And Jeff, by his own testimony, goes, I don't care what the Bible says. And the Christian says, well, why not? And he goes, ah, it's just a bunch of made up stuff. I don't, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in that stuff. The Christian said, well, you're not an atheist. And he says, well, what do you mean? He goes, well, an atheist is someone who studied all the religions, read their sacred texts, and concluded that there is no God. You've, you're trying to circumvent the entire process, and that's just lazy and not that smart. <laughs> so if you are an atheist, I invite you, go read the Quran. Go read the Bhagavad Gita. Go read all of the other manuscripts. Go read all of the ancient texts. And also read the Bible. And judge for yourself how they compare. But don't try to circumvent the entire process. Because that's coming more from your heart and not just your head. So, but the argument still comes like, well, how do we know? We weren't there. If you're, if you're just dead set on saying the resurrection did not happen, you say, how can you say it happened? You weren't there. To which I would say, you're absolutely right. I wasn't. I mean, I'm old. I turned 51 today, but I'm not that old. But you weren't there either. And with the same degree of passion that you can tell me that it, you can't say that it happened, if you weren't there, you can't say that it didn't. That argument cuts both ways. So we have to go back to say, well, what did the original people say? What, did, what, what were the original eyewitnesses? What about the people who were there? We have their reports who did claim to be there, and so let's just see if it's reasonable. Let's just open up the Bible and read this text and see if it's reasonable. Is it reasonable to believe that the resurrection happened? A couple of things from our text. First, look at verse 1. Now, after the Sabbath, that gives us a time. Toward the dawn of the first day of the week. That gives us a very specific time. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, that gives us two specific names, went to see the tomb. So now we're given a specific time. We're given specific people. And also note that it's women. Now, all of the gospel accounts record that it was women that Christ first appeared to. Every one of the gospel accounts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They are in agreement on this, that they were the first ones there to the tomb. And you say, well, why is that so significant? Here's why that's significant. Understanding cultural context and understanding what's going on that day and time. In that day and time, and I'm not saying this is right, and I'm not saying this should be our practice, I'm saying this was their practice back then. A woman's word just didn't count as much. You should not amen that. But in that day and time, I mean, and I'm not joking, but in that day and time, a woman's testimony was not admissible in court. A woman couldn't be an eyewitness to anything. A woman's word just wasn't taken seriously. It wasn't allowed in court. I'm not saying it's right, I'm just saying that's how it was. So my question is, if this story is fabricated, if Matthew made this up, why would, they, would he say, and why would all of the gospel writers say that women whose testimony was not allowed in court were the first ones to witness the resurrection? If you're making up a story, don't you want to tell a better lie? The best answer to this is that that's what happened. And they just told the truth. And also, just as a side, isn't it just like Jesus and his character and all the things that we read about him in the Gospels, isn't it just like Christ to elevate the status of the marginalized? Isn't it, doesn't that fit the profile? Second, why give names? Legends and myths tend to be a little bit vague. If you're trying to get something out, you don't want to have disprovable facts 
in there. They tend to not give details like names and places and times because those things are disprovable. But anybody could have went and asked these ladies. Here's her name. Go talk to her. They lived for another 40 some odd years. They were members of other churches. They continued to proclaim the resurrection and they said, go ask Mary. She was there. She saw him. Go ask the other Mary. She was there. She saw him. Go ask John and, and the disciples. Go ask any of these 500 people. We'll tell you their names, their addresses. We'll, we'll send you a request on Facebook that you can go friend them. They're there. Go ask them. Paul, I mentioned earlier, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 5-6, through 6, Paul says of Jesus that he appeared to Cephas, that means Peter, then to the twelve, and then appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Not meaning that they're narcoleptic, but they'd actually died. Paul himself says, listen, there's over 500 people that saw the resurrected Christ. You can go talk to them. And then finally... This is not from the text, but it is something that I think should be noted from from Christian history. Why would these men, Peter and the other disciples, die for their claim that Jesus did really resurrect from the dead if they knew for the fact that he did not? Men do not typically die for what they know to be a lie. So, Is it possible? It's possible. You you have to say the resurrection is possible. Is it reasonable? I think that you can look from the evidence and not just from these questions, but other things. I think that you can say, well, it is reasonable. But what does it mean? What does it mean if Jesus really did resurrect? First of all, it means that spiritual things aren't as scary as they used to be. Spiritual things just aren't that scary anymore. Look at verses 2 through 8. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. Now, I don't know the size of this angel. I don't know how big they are. I don't know if literally like this stone that is massive compared to Mary and the other Mary is simply like a step stool for the I don't know. It doesn't tell us size, but the Bible does tell us something about angels throughout history and throughout the Old Testament and even the New, and they're scary. And this text bears that out. Look at verse 3. His appearance was like lightning. That means it's kind of like looking at these lights, like turned up to like 100. It's like blinding. His clothing was white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. Now here are these hardened guards. that they've been stationed there to guard the tomb, to make sure that nobody stole Jesus' body. And when this angel shows up, they... eh. (laughs) They gone. Done. But then the angel addresses the women, but the angel said to the women, don't be afraid. So they they were scared too, okay? The women were scared too. And we're told that later on in the text. But they didn't pass out like these dudes did. (laughs) Do not be afraid. I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here for his reason. As he said. Oh, he told you he was going to do this. Come. See the place where he lay. I love this part about it. Jesus wasn't in the tomb. I mean, I don't know if you've noticed that. Like that, that He comes, he rolls away the stone, and it's not like Jesus is in there like, waiting to like, you know, as soon as they jump out, ha! It's not like that. No, he ain't in there. That, which means he got out of there before the stone was rolled away. Which makes sense because he also just popped in at places behind closed doors. Like, doors don't matter to Jesus anymore. That's what our resurrected bodies are going to be like, right? Amen? This is going to be like in heaven. There's going to be some conversations. You can just leave. (laughs) Not that you would have conversations like that. (laughs) There'll also be conversations you can just pop in on. Not that you would need to. But that's, you know. Jesus was not in the tomb. 
the angel rolled away the stone simply to show these ladies he ain't here. He didn't roll away the stone to let Jesus out. He rolled away the stone to let them in. That's it. Angels are spiritual things. They're spiritual beings. They're powerful. They can show up out of nowhere. They can defeat entire armies, the Old Testament tells us. And as beings that powerfully reflect the glory of God, they can be more than a little intimidating as these dudes at the tomb show. And note the contrast. They're there guarding a dead man's tomb and they become like dead men. And note the contrast between them and the women. They pass out. The women still standing. Listen, death is scary. But it's not as scary for those who believe in the resurrection. We don't grieve as those who have no hope. Spiritual things aren't as scary for the Christian anymore. I'm not saying that they're not scary at all. I'm saying the resurrection makes a difference in how you approach spiritual things. Second, it means that we have a mission. Look at verses 7 through 8. The angel says... In verse 7, Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There's one of our dudes in our church that has that tattooed on his arm. I will meet you in Galilee. I think it's one of the coolest tattoos I've ever seen. (laughs) He is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they quickly departed from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Here's the thing you need to understand. From the very beginning of Christianity, from the very beginning, Jesus' followers were commanded to tell others about his resurrection. If you're tired of your... If you're here today because your Christian friend has just wore the fuzz smooth off of you, inviting you to church, and you're just tired of hearing it, listen, you you need to know Jesus told them to. Jesus told them to do that. The resurrection is just too good a news for us to just keep to ourselves. We have a mission as Christians. Later on in in, in this gospel, in chapter 28, it's going to be called the Great Commission, where Jesus sends us out. All authority, heaven and earth, been given to Him, and He uses authority to send us out. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the best news in the world. We have got to tell others about it. Our Maker has given us a mission. We have a mission. You were invited. You were brought. And the reason that that person has invited you or brought you is because someone invited them and brought them. We are a missional organization. Unapologetically. Unapologetically. And what that means, thirdly, from our text, is that intimacy with God is possible. That God does not have to be something so far away, something that we only talk about when, when things are bad or we only think about when we're just... One, like it's not, No, intimacy, grabbing onto His feet. Look at verses 9 through 10. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came and took hold of His feet and worshipped Him. Listen, I... My, I my wife has a Toyota Camry, okay? I have a Toyota truck. It's my son's hand-me-down truck. That's what happens when you get old. You get your, you get your kids' hand-me-downs. I, I get his hand-me-down boots. I get his hand-me-down trucks, you know? Um, that's, that's what happens. So I'm driving his old Toyota. She drives a Toyota Camry. I drive a Toyota Tacoma. When, my, when either one of our cars break, because they're Toyota... I don't take them to the Chevy house. I don't take them to the Ford house. I don't take them to the Honda dealership. I don't take them to Lund's Volkswagen. I don't take them to Miller, uh, you know, Nissan. I don't even know if Miller Miller has a Nissan. But I don't take them to any of those other things. I take it back to its maker. That's That's who I take it to. If it has a problem as a Toyota, I take it to the Toyota dealership. Here, listen to me. Some of y'all, some of y'all are looking for love in all the wrong places. You're not going back to your maker. You're going to all these other parts houses, all these other dealerships. This life has busted you up and you keep running to the wrong dealership. Run to your maker like these ladies did. They're scared. They've been given this commission 
And they turn and they go, and behold, Jesus meets them. The resurrection shows that Jesus isn't just a man. He is the God-man. He's God in flesh. And notice that Jesus meets them in their obedience. Notice that. They get this commission from the angel. They haven't seen Jesus yet. They're scared, but also with their fear is great joy. And they turn to go. And before they even leave the garden, Jesus meets them. Here's what you need to know about this Jesus, this resurrected Jesus that I'm proclaiming to you. He always takes the first step. He always takes the first step. You say, well, wait a minute. No, they turned to obey and then that was No, no, no. He came out of that grave before they ever even got there. He always takes the first step. Jesus always takes the first step. He takes the first step in our disobedience. He's the good shepherd that runs after us, that comes to seek and to save that which was lost. And when we step toward him in obedience, he's the first one to run out there on the field and say, a boy, good job. a girl, way to go. That's our Jesus. He always is pursuing, always stepping toward us, never stepping away. That's our resurrected Jesus. And what does that erupt? What happens to these ladies when they see this? They fall at his feet. They hold, and not just they fall at his feet. Not like it's some king that's unapproachable and you got to get the certain pass and you stay 50 feet away. And, you know, not like that. No, they run to him. They fall at his feet. They hold on to his ankles and they're worshiping him. Let me tell you something Jesus will let you hold on to him. Jesus wants you to hold on to him. Jesus knows that he is the best thing for you. Not in some weird, arrogant, narcissistic way. But like in the same way that a nursing mom knows that she's the best thing for her baby. In a gentle, kind way. Jesus knows he's the best thing for you. He will let you hold on to him. You're not bothering him. You come before his feet and you lit up on your hands and lift your hands and you pray to him. He's not like up there standing away saying, get away from me, you little charismatic. He ain't like that. No, he's like, come bring it. He never denies the worship of his people. He always receives that. He lets us hold on to him. But notice this other aspect of this intimacy with God. Look what he says in verse 10. Go tell my brothers. Not not my disciples. Not go tell the adherents of the Christian faith. Go tell the Easter observers. Go tell the attenders of my lectures. No. No. Brothers, sisters. This is the language used throughout all of the rest of the epistles to describe the family of God. It's intimate. It's family. We're brought in. Listen, church, church is not just an event you attend. It is a body that you belong to. It is a family that you're a part of. And Jesus encapsulates this when he says, go tell my brothers to go to Galilee. And he's, we know that this is, if we go back in the other, the other gospel accounts, he, there's a passage in there that he says, I've no longer called you my disciples, I call you friends. Like there's a, he brings us in closer and closer. That's how it's supposed to be with Jesus. If you've been following Jesus for very long, and you find that you're not as close as you once were, that indicates that there's something wrong. It doesn't indicate that the relationship is over, but it does indicate that that's not how it's supposed to be. The longer we follow Jesus, the closer we should be getting to him. There's an old hymn that says, I'm so glad that I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Joint heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm part of the family, the family 
of God. That's just good. That's, that, that's who we are. We, we have a mission. We're traveling this side. We're, we're called to tell others, but we're family. We're part of the family of God. Brothers, sisters, we have intimacy with God through Jesus Christ. So here's my question. Do you want that kind of intimacy with God? Do you want that? It's only through Christ. Jesus says in John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. He is the man who died on the cross for our sin, the perfect sacrifice, the substitute for all of our sin. He died in our place and in exchange gives us his righteousness to all who would believe. He's the bridge between fallen man and glorious God. So do you want that? Do you want to be connected to your maker? Do you want that kind of intimacy with the person who created you, made you, knows you inside and out thoroughly, knows your past, knows your present, and knows your future? Do you want that? Come to Christ. Come to Christ. Say, I don't, I, but his resurrection, man, that's a hard thing to get over. I, listen, I want to invite you to cast aside your fear and your doubt of those things and just by faith believe to just say Jesus I don't know how it works but I'm going to trust that you died on the cross for my sin and that you rose from the grave I don't know how but I'm just by faith I'm going to just trust and believe that I'm going to ask you to, to do that now if you haven't already to cast aside your doubt and your fear to turn from your sin and trust the resurrected Christ. Say, Jesus, I don't know how, but I believe you did it. Would you forgive me of my sin? I'm yours. I want to follow you. And if you did that today, I want you to tell the person that brought you or tell me or tell somebody before you leave here today, say, hey, I, I started following this Jesus you're talking about today. Number two, if you're not quite ready to do that just yet, but you are interested, I want to invite you to have a conversation. We're going to be hunting Easter eggs here in just a little bit after we get through singing. There's going to be kids around. There's goodies and all kinds of stuff. Our hospitality team has done a fantastic job making things available out there. And I'm going to be around. Your friends are going to be around. Please, let's let's have a conversation or at least get something on the calendar where we can go talk. We can talk more about this. Number two, maybe you are a Christian already, but you've never been baptized. You're going to get to watch that happen here in just a little bit. That's why we got this big old steel horse trough on the stage. We're going to baptize one of our friends. We're going to get this stage slopping wet, and it's going to be awesome. There's going to be a song that's going to start when Matt comes up out of the water, and this place is going to be rocking. It is fantastic. And he's like, and if that ain't enough for you, you can come back next week because we're going to baptize another one of them next week. And I'd love for you to be one of them. I'd love for you to be one of them. If you've never been baptized. Listen, Jesus willingly and publicly died on the cross for you. I'm asking you to willingly and publicly get baptized for him. Number three, communion. We have elements sitting up here on the each station and in the middle. We got we know there's gonna be a lot of people here today, so we made overflow. I don't know how y'all are gonna figure out this crisscross thing, but don't try to swim upstream like a trout or a salmon. We're gonna come down these center aisles. We're going to go to one of these tables. If, they're, if it's too long there, go ahead and go to this one and then just go ahead and continue on. If you're coming down this way, it's too jammed up over there, go ahead and continue this way, continue on. Come down the center aisles, go back to your seats through the side aisles. People in the middle, figure it out. But we're going to take these elements. We're going to take this bread. It's unleavened, representing that there's no sin in Christ, our perfect sacrifice. And we're going to take that juice representing his blood that was shed on the cross, his perfect blood shed on the cross for us. And we're going to take that and we're going to ingest that. Remembering that through Christ and through his Holy Spirit, he's way, way deeper down in our bodies than just our stomachs. We're going to go back to our seats. And the band's going to start singing to our resurrected King. 
And if you're not a baptized believer, I want to tell you, you don't have to come down here and pretend to be something that you're not. You can set this out. It's okay. We're not, the, the, there's nothing special about this. It's not going to automatically make you a Christian. You can set that out and you can have a conversation with us afterwards and find out what that's about. But if you are a baptized believer, we invite you to come. Take communion. Remember who Jesus is. Remember our good, good King. And then we're going to sing. And I'm going to ask you to just lose your voice today singing. Just sing loud. Because Jesus is alive. And he's changed your life. And he's going to continue to change your life. I'm going to pray for you. Invite you to communion. And then we're going to sing our way out of here today. All right? Jesus, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you that you are the risen Lord. And God, if you are risen from the dead, then you can resurrect a dead marriage. If you are risen from the dead, then you can stop addiction. If you are risen from the dead, that there is nothing, there is no power too great for you to overcome. God, would you be glorified today. God, would you glorify yourself through saving sinners. God, would you glorify yourself by giving courage and giving great joy in the midst of great fear and bringing us to yourself. Some to step forward into baptism, others to step into mission. God, may our sin grieve us today. May your crucifixion and your resurrection empower us today. For your glory we ask it. Amen.